Are y'all ready for the word this morning? We started a series uh, a few weeks ago. I didn't intend to be for it to be a series, but the Lord spoke to me one morning. Uh, I tell the story again to in, to intro it, but I was uh, it was it was close to like one o'clock in the morning, and uh, it was Saturday night, and I get up at. Four o'clock on Sunday mornings to start preparing for the service, start praying and getting myself ready for the service. And so at one o'clock, I'm rest, tossing and turning. Now my wife, uh, she went out with the children, but uh, my wife can fall, lay down on the bed and go to sleep instantly. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. She can go anytime, any place, anywhere. She can be on a plane. She can be prop. She can be stand up, fall asleep. I have to have the right temperature. I have to be laying in the right position. I, I travel a lot with my pillows if I'm able to take my pillow with me uh, because, you know, hotel pillows just aren't the same. And so uh, anyway, I, I go through that. Uh, but I've been laying in bed before her because she was up doing some things. So I was in bed and I was trying to get to sleep. How many know it does not help if you're looking at that clock thinking, I got to get to sleep? I got, I've only got about two more. I got to get to sleep. Lord, help me. It's torment because you're thinking, I'm going to, I'm, when it, as soon as I go to sleep, I'm going to have to wake up. So I was doing that. And then she's already, you know, fast asleep. And all of a sudden I hear this beep, beep, beep. Pause. Beep, beep, beep. And then I knew what it was. It was our dishwasher. And our dishwasher, uh, uh, she, my wife had said it before we went to bed, and, and it alarms when the cycle is over. And, and it tells you, and it doesn't stop. It doesn't beep, you know, a series of beep and then stop. It snoozes and then comes back on, and it does it until someone opens the door and turns the power off. And so I'm laying there, and I was almost asleep. Come on, I was almost there. And I thought to myself, do I get up and turn it off? And that's going to wake me out of my almost sleep. Or is it going to annoy me so bad that I'm never able to go to sleep? So what do I, and I'm like, I'm just going to get up because this will drive me crazy. So I get up and as soon as my, my hand hits the, the dishwasher to pull open the door and to turn the power off, I heard the Holy Spirit say, like this alarm, I want you to prophesy to the people of God, the cycle is over. About that time, the Holy Spirit hit me. Forget about sleeping. I didn't even sleep that night. I went upstairs and started praying in my prayer room. And I began to say, God, what do you mean the cycle is over? He said, I want you to be annoying. Sometimes when you have to sound a prophetic alarm, it's annoying to people that want to sleep. It's annoying when you're saying, wake up. It's annoying when you're saying, it's time to get right with God. It's annoying when you keep prophesying and people are saying, be quiet. We're, we're trying to sleep, especially if they're trying to slumber. But see, that's what our mission is at Ramp Church Chattanooga. Not necessarily to be annoying, but to awaken the bride of Christ. To say, it's time to wake up. The church has been asleep long enough. We've sat beside and said, we've been silent. We've been trying to fit in with the world. But why are we trying to fit in with something we're called to stand out of? We're not called to look just like the world, sound like the world, uh, copy the world. We're called to be world changers. We're called to walk into an environment and shift that environment because of the God inside of us. Now, I'm not talking about, see, the, the, the saints of old got it wrong. It's not about, you know, wearing a bun on top of your head and not cutting your hair and not wearing stylish clothing. I'm not talking about all that. That's not an outward form of holiness. Uh, that's just religion. What I'm talking about is something people that say, I don't need to fit in with your clique or club. I can't laugh at the same jokes you're laughing at. I can't go to the same movies you're going to. I can't do those things. Why? Because my Holy Ghost inside of me won't let me do those things and it might offend him. It's not living according to religious law or meeting a, 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 a required agenda. It's about following the leading of the Holy Spirit. See, I wonder... No, I better not go there this morning. Okay. <laughs> I wonder about some people sometimes when they're full of the Holy Ghost, yet it doesn't bother them to murder somebody with their mouth. 
that same mouth praying in the praying in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost and giving their best worship. You meet them, at, you know, two hours after church, and they're like, "Let me tell you something." I'm getting bold to where I say, I don't want to hear it. Or let's go, just go get that person right now. <laughs> you know what frustrates people? Especially as a pastor, if somebody comes to you with a problem, and then they say, I want to tell you this, but you can't address it. I've come to the conclusion, I'm saying, well, don't tell me then. Because that's out of order. If I have to address something or bring correction, I need to be able to say, hey, so-and-so told me that this happened. That's just a little side note in case you have offense against your brother. Just get healed. Go to him and get healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But he spoke to me that morning. and He said, there's been a demonic haze that has tried to cloud the church. What I mean by that is I see uh, he showed me a vision of believers that were trying to walk through this uh, uh, thick fog and they could not see. So what happened was they were standing in place and I could see them trying to see their hands. Say, I'm, I have visions. If that's weird to you, I'm sorry. I, I've done seen visions, and the Lord shows me, speaks to me that way. But I saw them trying to see their hands and trying to see their feet, and they couldn't see clearly which way to go. So what happened was they were so frustrated because this fog was so thick, and the Lord described it to me as a demonic haze. They just began sitting down, sitting down right where they were. And see, that's what the enemy wants to do, is he wants to paralyze you right where you are. He, he wants to bring so much opposition against you to where you're in this thick fog and you can't see clearly. You can't see that God has a way out of no way, that God is making a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He wants you to be so clouded with deception to not know that your next step is stepping into breakthrough. Your next step is stepping into a season of harvest. So what he does is he comes in with an assault so great and the cloud is so thick and the fog is so thick that he robs you of your vision to where you get tired and you begin to forfeit what God has promised you. You just sit down right where you are. I don't need to pray. I don't need to fast. I don't need to get up to go to church. Nothing's changing. I can't see clearly if you could only see that you're so close to your breakthrough. See, I came to arrest the devil this morning and to get him off your back to tell you that haze is breaking over your life. That thick fog that has kept you bound because you could not see, it is lifting this morning in the name of Jesus. He said, the enemy sent a demonic haze to literally put the church to sleep. And he said, sound the alarm of awakening. God has pushed a reset button that in this hour, the bride of Christ becomes the warrior bride. Come on, I declare that this morning. No longer are we just the pretty little bride. We're not just the petite, little, pretty, little bride that, 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 no, no. We're the bride that's a warrior. We're a bride that says, uh, -uh I, I'm going to fight for you, God. Uh, uh. See, see, some, sometimes we want pretty church. We want non-offensive non church. We want the gimmicky church. Uh, 45 minutes and we want out the door. We want a church where we can blend and, and blend in and there's no account of no. God is saying, I'm calling forth a warrior bride that's dressed for battle, that's put on their armor and they're ready to take over and take authority and take dominion. Don't you understand, church? I'm preaching better than helping me. But don't you understand this morning that we can put the devil on the run? Don't you understand that we have dominion over the devil, that we're Wherever the soles of our feet go, we possess the land. He said, it's time for the warrior bride to arise. We've had the nice, pretty, sweet bride. And I'm not talking about being hateful. Let me just say that. Because I've encountered a lot of hateful Christians. It's not, I'm not talking about being hateful. I'm talking about being aggressive for what God has promised. 
Hunter, who does our media, he's such a blessing to us. One of the things I told him is I said, don't put little sweet music behind me. If you do a clip of me preaching, don't put a uh, nice little sweet music behind me unless it's a holy moment. I said, because that gives people the wrong impression. You need to put some aggressive music behind because our vision is not sweet little, little. I know the Holy Spirit moves in different ways. So don't, yeah, I, you don't need to write me and tell me. Don't, you, sometimes he moves quietly. I, got, I understand. There's a lot of times that he moves quietly, quietly in my life. But when I come corporately, I'm here to charge an army. I'm here to raise up warriors. I'm here to equip the bride. And, and that doesn't move in a quiet way for me. That's not how the Holy Spirit has used me. But, but he's told me, he said, sound the alarm of awakening and let the church know that no longer can we slumber and he said to me remember how annoying that dishwasher alarm was if I could have from my bed I would have pushed a button so it would have stopped and I could have slept on he said that's what the the, the church does if we can shut it down we will because we want to sleep. The enemy has lullabied us, put us in a haze or of confusion to where we want to sleep, but we can no longer sleep. Why? Because there are some leaders, there are some people, there's some prophetic voices sounding the alarm saying, wake up. This is our finest hour. I know we've been under attack. I know we've been under opposition. I know the devil's been running rampant, but this is still our finest hour. This is the moment we're going to gain ground, take ground, take the spoils of the enemy, take the plunder of the enemy we're going to see the greatest move of God that we have ever seen before the church isn't backing up it's not decaying or dying the awakening is happening now in Jesus name it's not coming one day it's here now it's here now in Jesus name he said the cycle is broken now I want you to turn with me let's go to Genesis chapter 37 I'm going to try to preach this as quickly as I can So if I start speaking real fast, when I, whenever I feel the fire of the Holy Ghost, I start speaking real fast. And sometimes people tell me, slow down, slow down. Uh, when he starts moving like that, it's almost impossible for me to slow down. So you might have to go back on YouTube or Facebook and, and watch it if you miss something. But uh, the Lord is opening your ears in Jesus' name. He's putting a watch upon my mouth and a guard upon my tongue in Jesus' name. But Genesis chapter 37 now, I don't have time to preach the whole story of Joseph, but I love Joseph. Anybody else? I love Joseph. Joseph is one of my favorites. Why? Because he went through ups and downs and he went through ins and outs and he went through persecution and yet God still favored him. Now, his story begins in chapter 37 with his father, Jacob. Jacob is Israel. His father, uh, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his brothers. Now, parents in this room, if you have a favorite child, don't let the other children know it uh, because they'll have a spirit of rejection. But, you know, sometimes... You might have a favorite child. I don't, I don't know. I have two. I favor both of them on different days. I'm like, that one's. <laughs> this morning, no, Juliana's definitely my. I'm just being real. Come on. You know when they're throwing that fit, you're like, you are not my. You're thinking in your head. You don't say it. I hope you don't say it. But in your head, you're like, you are not my favorite <laughs> Uh, y'all bear with me I've had a little sleep so when I've had a little bit of sleep I get silly so I'm going to focus this morning by the Holy Ghost but his story begins and and Jacob loves him most because he's he's the the son of the the wife that Jacob loved and he was a son the word says a son of his old age so he was the youngest <laughs> my um, let me share a quick story uh yesterday uh, Gabriel was, was not feeling the greatest, and so he was pitching a fit. He had uh, had very little sleep, and, and he had just, you could just tell he was kind of moody or whatever. And so uh, he was pitching a fit, and I told Juliana, just, just give him the drink. Now, I don't do this normally, 
But I said, just give him the drink. He wants the blue one. Give him the blue one. You take the clear one. It's fine. And she was like, but I want the blue one. And I said, Juliana, he doesn't feel good. And she goes, Daddy, um, we don't need to give in to his fits. And I said, I know. We normally don't, but he doesn't feel good today, so we're going to give him grace. <laughs> she, said, she said, you don't give in to when I pitch my fit. And I said, honey, I've given in to a lot of your fits. <laughs> but no, we, we, we try not to so they don't get rewarded for that behavior. But anyway. At that moment, it was just like, he already didn't feel well. He was tired. So I was like, just, it doesn't matter if it's blue juice or clear juice or whatever. Just switch with him. I just thought that was funny. Because sometimes the youngest, you give in to their little fits because you're already tired from dealing with the oldest. But anyway, Joseph was still his favorite. And the word says that, that his father makes him a coat of many colors. Are y'all still with me? Let's look at it together. Chapter 37. And let's look at uh, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all, the, all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now that's some real hate. When you can't even speak to your brother. Have you ever walked into a room and you know that someone can't stand you? Oh, I have. You can sense it. You can sense it when you walk into a room. Now, my wife is real good because she'll make people talk to them. Me, I don't care. I'll just walk. <laughs> my wife will go straight up to them. And, How are you doing? I'm thinking, just let it go. Who cares? They need deliverance in Jesus' name. But they saw that their father loved him more than all the brethren, and they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, I'm going to sum some of this up because of where we're going this morning. But the, the, the fact that he loved him more and he gave him a coat of many colors, it's important to understand that the coat of many colors was actually a mark of honor. It was a ranking system. It was talking about the birthright. Now, Joseph was not the oldest son, so by, by spiritual law, he should not have been the one to get the birthright. However, do you know that God will bypass some people sometimes to give you what he wants to give you? It doesn't matter if you're next in line. It doesn't matter if people agree that you're the one that should be blessed. It doesn't matter if people think you're qualified enough or if you look the part enough if you have all the right degrees and all the right resources and all the right connections and I wish somebody would help me in this morning because God's about to bypass some people to get to you because he knows the favor of God that's on your life and it's a mark of honor it was a mark of favor it was a mark of love it was actually a mantle that his father had put upon him now think about that we talk about mantles all the time begin to think about that his father Jacob put a mantle of favor on Joseph and then the brothers saw that Jacob loved him more and they began to hate him for it sometimes you don't understand why people have rejected you it's because the favor of God's on your life you don't understand when you've tried to make them like you and they still don't like you it's because God has favored you go ahead and wear your mantle it doesn't matter what they think they wouldn't like it anyway they wouldn't like you anyway because you may not have it on your body but let me tell you when God places a mantle on your life no man can steal it when God says you're lifted up nobody can put their foot on you I'm about to shout myself in Jesus' name. I think I will. Hallelujah. But it was a mark of honor. It was a, uh, a, he was declaring that he was the chief heir. Now, I know the brothers would be highly bothered by that. When they saw it, they hated. Now, I want to skip over. Now, what happens is, uh, let me just sum this up. They take Joseph, the brothers take Joseph, and 
they see him coming from afar off is what the word says. And he's the dreamer. Remember, he dreams and he begins to give prophetic dreams and visions and God begins to speak. That makes him even more angry. And so they see him coming from afar off and the word says that they conspire against him. See, I want to talk to some people. Maybe you're online this morning, but I believe there's some people in this house that the enemy has conspired against you. The enemy has devised plans to come against against you to stop God's promise in your life. But I'm telling you this morning, it can't be stopped. It cannot be stopped. And so what happens is they throw him into a pit and the word clearly says that there was no water in the pit. Can you imagine your brothers stripping you of your coat of, uh, of honor that your father made you? A mantle of favor, and they stripped him of it. And then they threw their brother into a pit. And they're, th they're thinking about killing him. You know the story of Joseph. They begin to come up with plans how to kill them. One brother, he speaks up and he says, let's not kill him. What, what do we gain if we kill him? Let's sell him. We'll get some money off of his misfortune down there in the pit. See, there's some people that when you're in the pit of life, they want to get some payback they want to they want to get some uh, uh, uh some blessing off of your misfortune and so they say here comes a band of ishmaelites we'll sell him into slavery we'll sell him and we'll make some money and we'll just pretend like he's dead because he's as good as dead but they didn't know that favor of god could not be stopped and so what they did, and I, I, I'm summing this up, what they did is they took that coat that, that said he was the chief heir or that mantle, and they went and killed an animal and dipped it in blood. And they went back to their father, Jacob, and they said, look, this is what we found. It's Joseph's. Is this Joseph's? They asked. Is this Joseph's coat? And the father went to pieces and they said, an animal has devoured him. Now, I want you to notice that. You'll understand it in just a minute. And so they, they say the animals devoured him. But what they didn't understand is those Ishmaelites. I love the scripture where it says, and they took Joseph into Egypt. See, even when the enemy thinks he is throwing you down further, he doesn't understand that God is using that as a mode of transportation to get you to the right place at the right time to accomplish his mission. There's no hindrances in God. And, and so they bring him over into Egypt. And then you can study all this out. It's in the 37, 38, 39, 40 and uh, 41, but uh, he begins to, uh, he's sold to Potiphar. And he becomes chief heir of Potiphar's house because it continues to say, I love it. The Lord was with Joseph. Sometimes in your situation, you need to just start reminding yourself, and the Lord is with Andrew. I found myself the other day walking through my house saying, and the Lord is with Andrew. <laughs> and the Lord is with, and you hear me, circumstance? And the Lord is with Andrew. <laughs> I know what it looks like. I know what they said. The Lord is with Andrew. <laughs> You're about to see it. <laughs> You're about to see it. I don't care what they took from me. You're about to see the Lord is with me. The Lord is for me. The Lord is fighting for me. See, you need to get violent with your words. And you need to begin to say, and the Lord was with and the Lord was with, yeah, yeah, began to put your name there. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he becomes highest rank official in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar is married to a woman who had a lust demon. And she began to lust after Joseph. And she began to try to convince him to fall into sin with her. And, and he would not fall into sin because his relationship with God. And I want you to turn with me. Let's, let's look at it together. Chapter 39. Let's look at verse 12. And it says this. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. 
See, some of you need to get out. Some of you need to get out of that situation. You've been standing there saying, well, I'm trying to appease everybody. I don't want to fall to sin, but you're playing around with dead things. Get out. Come on. It doesn't matter. Well, I don't want to leave. I just got this garment. I don't want to leave it. Some of you need to say, it, it ain't worth my holiness. It ain't worth getting out of covenant with God. You aren't worth. There's nobody worth missing the plan and the purpose of God for your life. And so the word says that she caught him by his garment. Remember, his brothers caught him by his uh, mantle or coat of many colors, and they stripped it from him, and they used it to lie on him. Now she catches him by his garment, and the word says she waited for Potiphar to get home, and then she took that garment, and she said, your Hebrew servant tried to rape me. Look, he left his garment in my hand when I tried to scream. See, the enemy will use what God puts on you to try to lie against you. Ever since Joseph was wearing that coat, the enemy thought, if I could steal that coat from him, then he's done for. But what he didn't know is the Lord was with Joseph. What he didn't understand is the Lord is with you. So that lustful uh, wife of Potiphar said, if I can just catch him by his garment, he'll surely lay with me. But he fled from her, and then she said, okay, I'm going to use this garment to lie on him again. See, the enemy will try to lie on you using your own mantle against you. So she took the mantle and she said, Potiphar, this, he tried to rape me. Potiphar was so angry, he threw him into the lowest pit of prison. And there he met two people, a butler and a baker. And then he begins to prophesy to them. He interprets their dream and he says, you're going to die. Come on, can you imagine? You're going to die. Your head's going to be killed. You're going to be, and then the other one, you're going to be restored. And when you're restored to the butler, he said, when you're restored, I want you to remember me. And of course, he's restored, and he doesn't remember Joseph. Until... Somebody say, until. See, some of you thought God forgot about you. You thought God forgot about you. I want to say that again. You thought God forgot about you. And you said, I don't understand it. I have a promise for God from God. God told me he was going to do this. God told me he was going to restore my family. God told me he was going to do this for me. God was going to use me in this area. But it looks opposite of what God's promised. I'm still locked in prison. And the butler I prophesied to forgot about me. Maybe God's forgotten about me. And you're down there in the lowest part of the prison. But suddenly, Pharaoh had a dream. And no one could interpret this dream. And then it came back to the butler. Oh, yeah. That prophet that interpreted my dream told me I would be restored and the baker would die. And he was accurate. He interprets dreams. Let's call for him. See, God will cause a need that only you can meet. They may have the talent and the ability, but you've got the favor and you've got the anointing. And you've got, there's some things that are meant for you that nobody else can have because God meant them for you and nobody can steal it. No, take ease. Nobody can take it. Nobody can possess it, but you. And so the word says that, that Joseph was in prison, and then they called for him at Pharaoh's dream. Let's look at it together. Let's look at verse, uh, let's skip on down. Chapter 41, and then let's go to uh, verse 14. I told you all, the hardest part of preaching is editing, especially for one sermon, because I would just preach the whole chapter and read you every verse, because it's all good, so go read it for yourself, but... Uh, verse 14 says, then Pharaoh sent and called to Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. I don't know who this word is for, but you're coming hastily out. That word hastily means suddenly. It means immediately. I know it seemed like a long time and nothing was happening and you thought maybe God's forgotten about me. This one forgot about me. But God said, I can do a suddenly in one moment's time and bring you out hastily and bring you into the right place at the right time to meet the right person that's going to change the trajectory of your life. I I don't know who I'm prophesying to today, but God has not forgotten you. God has not abandoned you, and the Lord is with you. You are coming out hastily. 
And then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him out hastily out of the dungeon. Notice this in verse 14. And shaved him, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment. He changed his garment. Now, I don't have time to really teach that, but it's important to understand that in the Egyptian uh, community, you only had a long beard if you were in mourning. In the Jewish community, you would only shave if you were in mourning. So what he did was he said, okay, God is shifting the trajectory of my life. So I'm going to, 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 to uh, shave and put on new clothes because these dungeon clothes aren't prepared, aren't look, do not look the part of where I am going in my destiny right now. See, some of you are about to get a change of wardrobe. You're about to get a change in what you wear because the enemy has told you you'll always be in those dungeon clothes. But I'm telling you, God is with you. And though they stripped you of the coat of favor and the coat of color, and though Potiphar's wife stripped you of the garment that you wore and used that cloak to lie against you, God is going to call you out hastily and he's going to take those dungeon clothes that the enemy tried to put on you because today I prophesy to you sitting in this room there is a new mantle that is coming upon your life and it is called a mantle of favor it is called a mantle of blessing it is called a mantle that God is raising you up hastily right now in Jesus name and it says that he changed and he shaved because of where God was taking him and then he said he interpreted the dream and he told Pharaoh the interpretation. But I want us to skip on. Let's look at verse 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servant. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? See, I want you to see that. See that in the scripture. Because it's not about those outward things. They may have taken away a title. They may have taken away a job. They may have taken away uh, uh, whatever it is, but I want to tell you, they can't take away the spirit of God that's inside of you. They can't take away God's mantle and ordained plan over your life. Can we find such a man as one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath shewed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all the people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Verse 42. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and he put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him with a vesture of fine linen. Notice that. You're about to be dressed in fine linen. You don't want that, that slavery clothes. You don't want what Potiphar had. Even the coat of colors that your dad gave for you. You walk into a room in, in Egypt and that coat is not going to mean anything to them. But when you walk in with a fine vesture, a fine linen, they're going to know that you're right under Pharaoh. And when you speak a word, they're going to move. When you release it, oh, I don't know who this is for, but this is so good to me this morning that they strip you, but God's about to mantle you with something new. You are coming out with robes of royalty. He said it's a day of promotion. It's a day of royalty. It's a day I'm calling you into the new and he said I'm going to drape you with what only I can drape you with. There is a new mantle that is coming on your life. The enemy's tried to steal, to kill, to destroy, but the enemy is defeated and God is victorious and his plan has prevailed in your life. That's the reason you're here this morning is because God's plan prevailed in your life. The enemy still wants you in the dungeon, but you came to hear this word because the word of God begins to shift the trajectory of your life. The reason you're watching this service by live stream is because God is shifting. He said, I'm putting on you a new mantle. It doesn't matter what you lost, but I'm going to put on the robe of royalty for where you're going because the spirit of God is with you. See, the enemy wasn't just after his coat. He was after his destiny. He wasn't just after 
the outward sign of favor of the Father. He wanted to utterly destroy him. He wasn't just after his, his robe that he wore in Potiphar's house. No, he wanted to use it to lie on him. But God said, I'm about to dress you in something that's going to be the reward of God. And when people see it, they are going to know that only God did that. I prophesy this to you this morning. God is going to move in such a way in your life that they are going to know. Everyone is going to know. Only God could do that. Only God could raise them up. Only God could give them that revelation. Only God could favor them like that. Only God, only God could heal their body. Only God could restore their marriage. Only God could call their prodigal children home. Only God could bless that business, press down, shaken together, and running over. Only God could give them an idea that shifts their financial life forever. Only God. See, I know some of you are thinking, I need to chase after people. I've been there. I fight that too. We're, 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 why are we settling for a human, a man, a flesh, a man or woman when we can chase after God? Every good gift comes from the Father. And yet you're chasing that person saying, bless me, like me, prove me. And I'm not saying be hateful or not, not, not make connections. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that God can do what only God can do. It doesn't matter if they ganged up against you and said, I, I don't want them. You know, I was talking to, uh, to a minister the other day, and he said, you know, I had some ministers that came up against me and said, we're going to uh, close the doors for him because we don't, we don't like him. We don't like his message. And so they began to call conferences. It's like a hit club. They began to call different ones that, that, that come on, mob boss mentality, and say, you don't want to have them at your church. And you don't want, so they get all these cancellations. And, and I said to them, yes, but God is the open door. The word says that Jesus, Jesus is the doorway. So he will open a door for you that no man can shut. And he will close doors that no man can open. Quit chasing after man to get you that booking. Quit chasing after man. Please like me. Please approve of me. I heard T.D. Jakes, Bishop Jakes, a long time ago say something that made an impression on me as a boy. He said, I don't chase after anybody with my business card. Saying, here's my business card. He said, no, I let God speak for me. Because God will open up doors that no man can shut. I'm telling Telling you that changed me as a boy because I don't have to run after you saying, look at what I'm doing. Look at this. And that doesn't mean that I'm not connecting or saying, you know, uh, I'm going to connect with you because I feel a divine connection. But what I'm saying is, why cheat, settle for a cheap substitute called man when you can have God Almighty that will open up every door and make a way out of no way? Ooh, I feel that right now. Some of you need to quit, give up on people and start running to the throne. Some of us need to start running to the throne and saying, God, I'm running after you. Why would I settle for someone that I think is important when I can run to God, the creator of everything? See, we need a fresh revelation of the God that we serve because we think people are so powerful and thank God for the ones he's put in leadership, but, but they're not powerful. I mean, they, they're only given what, what they're entrusted to. We serve the creator of the universe. He's the one that lifts up one and takes down another. The hearts of kings are in his hands. So why are we chasing people when we should be chasing after God? Oh, didn't plan to share that this morning. I just feel that this morning. But I want to, and I'm concluding this morning. I know y'all don't believe it, but I am. Y'all are supposed to laugh there. My wife sometimes says, you're not as funny as you think you are. I said, you're not either. <laughs> you're, you're really not. But... The devil was after what Joseph wore. Now get this. All the pressure that Joseph went through was to get him to the palace. The pressure you've been under in your life is to get you to the palace of what God has called you for. I want you to look finally at Genesis chapter 41, verses 51 and 52. And it says this. And Joseph... Joseph marries, and then it says, and Joseph 
called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. I want to stop right there for a moment. Today is 8 one Eight is the number of new beginnings in the word. I'm not using numerology. I'm using proven uh, uh, God uses numbers. So if you don't like that, I, I don't honor numbers above God. Come on. I don't practice numerology. However, God uses numbers to signify things. Eight is the number of new beginnings. And I came this morning to declare and to prophesy to you. Today begins a new beginning. You don't have to receive it, but I'm receiving it for myself. Today begins a, a day of new beginnings. And Joseph had gone through all of these ups and downs and ins and outs. And one thing I love about Joseph, I write about it in my book, is he would have settled for being top dog in Potiphar's house. He thought he had it good. He was like, I'm the top servant. I, I like it here. I'm blessed. I'm enjoying the blessings. The word says God blessed Potiphar's house because of Joseph. See, some of your bosses are blessed because you're there. Uh, but he was blessed because he was there and he was enjoying Potiphar's blessings. But sometimes those things have to be stripped because God said, I didn't call you to be the ruler of Potiphar's house. I called you to be the ruler of Egypt. See, we don't understand when we lose something. Sometimes I've lost doors and I thought, God, why did that door shut? I love that door. Anybody? Anybody? I love that. Uh, that, was, that was a great source of provision. That was a, why? Because you're settling for Potiphar when I have Egypt for you. God always has better. I said God always has better. But now he's dressed in his royal apparel. And it wasn't only for him, but he saved a whole nation because I don't have time to preach that this morning. But I want to get this last word into you. 4152, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, he hath made me forget all my toil. He made me forget all my pressure. He made me forget everything I went through. Come on, those memories are, are going to fade. All those heartbreaks are going to fade because God says to you this morning, what I am doing in this now season is going to make you forget all the shame of your youth, make you forget all the pain that you went through, all the hell that broke loose in your life. What I'm doing in this now new season is going to be so much better than anything you've ever experienced before. He said it's going to make you forget all your toil. Come on, that's what happens when a mother births a baby. You forget the pain. Or maybe a little bit forget the pain. You're so happy. I hope you're so happy to see your baby. hope you're not like... <laughs> Let's move on. I hope you're not like, get that thing away from me. <laughs> oh. Anyway, M Manasseh, forgetful, or the Lord has caused me to forget all the troubles of my father's house is what Manasseh means. And the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. The name Ephraim means doubly fruitful, or the Lord has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. I'm telling you this morning, get ready for double. Nancy, three people received it. Uh, I want to know. God says, get ready for the double. Some of you are sitting there saying, I've heard about double before. I I've heard this message. All you need is to hear the word in the right season, and it will shift, and it will begin to manifest in your life. And I come with a word that you are going to birth a Manasseh that makes you forget, and you're going to birth an Ephraim that blesses you right in the midland of your affliction. And I'm going to give you a double blessing not just one thing but God said I'm a God of wholeness nothing missing nothing broken I will fix your finances as well as fix your family I will fix your ministry as well as fix your finances come on somebody he said, I'm going to bless you in a double way. He spoke to me and he said this morning Isaiah 61 7 for your shame 
for everything they stripped from you, from every lie they told on you, from every time you were rejected, from every time. I, I don't know who. I've come to arrest somebody this morning. For every rumor they started on your name, for every time they shut the, 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 the phone down on you and said, I'm going to keep them out. For your shame, you shall have double. And for your confusion, they will rejoice in your portion. God's about to put a new mantle on you, a mantle of royalty, a vesture of honor, a vesture of kingship. He said, for their land, they shall rejoice in your portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double, everlasting joy unto them. He told me to say and to decree and prophesy over you. You say, why do you keep saying that? Because you need to know that God is speaking a prophetic word over you and you war with your prophecies. That means when you come up under attack, you begin to say, God promised me double. I don't care what it looks like. God, you said, you said. He honors his word above his own name. Come on, you need to know who you're talking about. The creator of everything. He said, you shall present everlasting joy shall be unto them. He said to me to say to you, this is a season of the double portion. Double birthing and double reward. This is the season of a double portion, double birthing, and double reward. I don't care that we look like we're in the land of affliction. God will take that affliction and begin to bless you. He'll begin to use you. He'll begin to multiply you. He'll begin to make you forget everything you went through, how they talked about you. You know, it's so funny. It's so funny because there's some things I can't even remember. Somebody will bring something up. Remember, we don't like so-and-so because they did this. And I was like, I don't even remember that. You know why? Because the Lord has blessed me to make me forget. Thank God I dropped the charges because I need God to forget some of my past. I need God to forget some things that I went through. So, so how dare I keep an account and keep you? Now, don't be stupid. Yeah, the preacher just said stupid. Don't be stupid and say, okay, I know I, I, I'm going to open myself back up. Use me again. No. You can forgive and forget and move forward. But you don't open yourself back up to an assault and say, come step on me some more. Okay, rob, rob me some more. No. You stand up and say, I truly forgive. I drop the charges. It's gone. And the Lord will make you forget. See, when you step into a level of blessing, you begin to forget some of the hell that you went through. The only time I remember some of it is when I'm trying to help somebody else out of their trouble. I don't sit, the Lord delivered me of three years of depression. I don't sit and think about, oh, I was so depressed. God, the enemy robbed me of three years of my life where I stared at a wall for, no. I don't sit there and think about that until I get on a platform and I start seeing the spirit of depression in somebody's life. And I, can be, I say, no, I've got victory over that. So I'm going to help you overcome that. See, some of us dwell too much on the past. We need to be thinking about what God is doing now, what God is doing in the future. He said, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not see it? Why are you still looking behind you? Why are you still looking? It's time to forget all that and start looking ahead. Because God says to you this morning, a double portion, a double birthing, pray double, declare double, believe for double. See, I, I, I'm believing for double in this house. I'm believing. I, I, I already begin to check. What can we do to enlarge this sanctuary? What walls can we knock out? How can we begin to improve it? Come on. You say, well, why are you doing that? Because I have a big God and I have a big dream. I have a big promise and I have a big vision. God says, declare double, believe for double, pray for double. It's a season of double, double portion, double birthing, double reward. For all the hell that you went through.